Welcome to Ask the Expert, featuring leading neurologist and muscle physiologist, Dr. Stephen Cannon, answering some of the most often asked questions from our website and social media channels. Remember, the content in this video is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions regarding a specific medical condition. Here's Kinsey's question. My blood work never falls out of normal range, but I have paralysis attacks. Doctors say I cannot have periodic paralysis unless it is out of normal range. Does this mean I have normo PP? There are a lot of contexts in which the topic of normokalemic periodic paralysis comes up, normo PP, both from patients who are frustrated that attack after attack, the value is normal uh, when they get tested in the emergency room, um, or from physicians who've looked at the literature and you can see normal PP out there. But um, the big piece of strong evidence came uh, several years ago when the index family, large multi-generations, which what was thought to be normal PP when genetic testing was available, it's the second most common cause of hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. It's the M1592V mutation. There was another big normal PP family. It had the T704 mutation in the sodium channel. Both sodium channel mutations, in both families there was myotonia. It's very clear this is just the range of variability in the way hyper PP Presents. So periodic paralysis has been recognized for almost 150 years by physicians and as you can imagine there was a lot of attention and curiosity because the symptoms are so dramatic to be profoundly weak and then a half hour later get up and walk away. And one of the earliest recognized abnormalities was a change in the potassium level. Uh, the initial ones that were recognized were low potassium, abnormally low, that's hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And about 20 years later additional cases, this is now the mid-1950s, were recognized where the potassium is too high. And so uh, physicians began to focus on these blood potassium levels, first of all, because it helped to make the diagnosis. Second of all, it was a um, convenient strategy to try to help these individuals. If you have attacks when your potassium is low, well, we know a lot of ways to try to help maintain a higher potassium level by what you eat, avoiding certain medications, avoiding stressful situations, things like that. So a lot of attention has, has focused on the potassium story. Well, in 1960, there was a very famous medical uh, paper that described a third type of periodic paralysis, so-called normokalemic periodic paralysis, because despite the fact there were many witnessed uh, episodes of weakness um, that happened in a hospital setting, they were able to measure the blood potassium and it was normal. And uh, this is much less frequent than the other two, but it led to the question of whether there's another condition, normal kalemic periodic paralysis. There were several features of the way these patients had symptoms though. So some of them had the myotonic stiffness. In some individuals, even though the blood potassium was normal, if they ate food with high potassium content, it could trigger an attack. So there was a lot of overlap with the hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Go fast forward 30 years, make a long story short, some of these very famous normal kalemic periodic paralysis families that are in the medical literature, now that the gene testing is available, they have commonly occurring mutations in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. So this is just the variability in which the disease can be manifest. For my thinking, normal kalemic periodic paralysis is just an overlap syndrome with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and responds very similarly. Patients with uh, well-established hypo-PP or hyper-PP may have an episode of significant weakness, profound weakness, and yet the blood test shows a normal level. All of us with experience with disease, doctors and patients alike have recognized this. And this is just part of sort of the statistical nature of the association between the potassium levels and an attack. So in some regards, it's just the biology. So when your potassium is abnormal, it puts you at risk. If your potassium is low, it puts you at risk if you're a hypo-PP patient. But you won't have an attack with every episode of low potassium. Conversely, sometimes you can have an attack when your potassium is in a fairly normal range. And so this is just, you know, the spice of life, the variety of how things happen. And what's really important 
is that no healthcare professional should say this excludes the diagnosis of periodic paralysis because your potassium is normal while you were profoundly weak in the emergency room. Potassium values are useful for guiding principles, for helping lifestyle changes to minimize the frequency and severity of attacks, but the potassium does not have to always be abnormal during an attack. Many individuals who have periodic paralysis, they have recurrent attacks of weakness, sometimes they end up in the emergency room, and time after time the potassium level is normal. So they're up against biases from the physicians. It's like, this can't be hypo-PP, this can't be hyper-PP, your potassium is normal. So I think part of it is driven by patients want to have legitimacy of their diagnosis. So I think that's part of the driver for it, because if you really were to look carefully and um, in a controlled uh, medical setting, be able to continuously measure potassium and so forth, you wouldn't see it so frequently. But you have to remember what happens. Somebody's getting into trouble at home, takes a half an hour to get to the emergency room, the nurse checks you in, they look for your insurance, it's 45 minutes later when the physician shows up. It's been two hours since your attack started. So part of it is the timing. You might already be regaining strength and the potassium level is normalizing and it's, it's gonna be normal in the blood. So there are a lot of factors uh, that feed into this, um, but it's a very common outcome that the blood potassium is gonna be within the normal range, even though someone with periodic paralysis had a significant episode. Statistically, most likely they're gonna have hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Um, the big tip off um, for distinguishing the type, you would think it's easy. You know, get a blood test. My goodness, every time I just go for a routine well health checkup, they draw blood, they tell me what the potassium is. What, what's the big deal? The problem is it's a moving target, it's variable, the interpretation isn't straightforward. So measuring the potassium isn't hard, but just making the association with your attacks of weakness, there's a lot of uh, sloshiness um, about that and, and, and makes it difficult. It's important to try to figure it out though, because the recommendations for what to do are polar opposites if you have hypo-PP versus hyper-PP. One of the tip-offs is if you have myotonia, so the involuntary persistent contractions that is sort of like activity dependent stiffness, this muscle stiffness, perhaps verified with a needle electromyogram by your neurologist, if that is part of your syndrome, even if you don't have genetic testing, even if your potassium level has never been abnormal, if you have myotonia and recurrent attacks of weakness, for my money, you have a hyper-PP variant and you should treat it with the recommendations that we put out there for hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. You're not doing any harm by calling it normal PP, but um, I think the important pragmatic aspect for patients and their physicians is the treatment recommendations should follow what we do for hyper PP if you think you have normal PP. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.